Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming to today's Dean's Lecture. Uh, I'm Mike Clagg, Dean of the School, and this is the last Dean's Lecture of the year, so, and I know it's going to be a great one. So uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, what we do is we recognize the appointment and uh, promotion of people as full professors in the school by asking them to give a Dean's Lecture to the school community. And as I always say at these events, it's a high bar to be to be appointed to the faculty at Hopkins, but to reach the level of professor is an incredibly high bar. And it's a decision that's not made uh, by us or the A&P committee. It's really made by peers around the world who write to us uh, in evaluation of, of the candidates. And today, we're celebrating the uh, uh, appointment of a very special person, uh, Nilan John Chatterjee, who's a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor, came to us, I think, last October or so uh, from the NIH, where he had been for a number of years. Uh, he's uh, jointly appointed uh, two primaries here in our school in the Department of Biostatistics and in the School of Medicine in the Department of Oncology. Before coming here, he was senior investigator and the chief of the biostatistics branch at the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda. He was there for 16 years, and over that 16 years, he developed a broad program of quantitative research to investigate genetic and environmental causes of cancers and means of cancer prevention. He's led a number of methodological studies that address important questions across a wide spectrum of issues faced in modern population-based studies, including study design, methods for interactions, causal inference, assessment of individualized risk, and evaluation of risk models for public health applications. He's played a key role as a collaborator in many epidemiologic studies, including GWAS studies that have led to increased understanding of the genetic basis, basis of many cancers. He came to us as a, with a reputation as a great mentor, and, and that's been held up in the short time he's been here. He's, uh, he's mentored many pre-docs and postdoctoral trainees in a wide variety of applications, from biostatistics to epidemiology to statistical genetics. He received his bachelor's and master's degree with distinction in statistics from the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta, India, and his PhD in statistics from the University of Washington in Seattle. And it often seems to me that we have a, we have a, a like an express train between here and say, I guess it's an express flight between here and, and, and the University of Washington in terms of biostatistics. He's an associate editor of the Journal of the American Statistical Association and editor of Sankhya. Series B, the Indian Journal of Statistics. He's an elected member of the uh, American Epidemiological Society and has received numerous awards. I mean, he has several pages of awards in his CD, so I'm, in his CV, so I'm just going to list a few. Uh, the Mortimer, uh, Mortimer Spiegelman Award, the George W. Uh, Snedeker Award, uh, and um, for instr instrumental contribution to the theory of biometry, and the President's Award for 2011 from the Committee of the Presidents of the Statistical Societies for outstanding contributions to statistics by an individual under age 41. So 41, I don't know, it's a prime number. I was trying to figure out why, because you won one, you won the, uh, the Cox Award for under 45, so I figured they must have some way of placing the age cutoff. They, you know, they, they obviously did an optimization exercise to figure out what the right ages are. But, uh, but in any case, um, I, I think you'll find, as I have found, that uh, it, uh, Nilan John is uh, both smart, articulate, and a great colleague. So uh, please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Uh, thanks, Mike, for the, the kind introduction, and, and it's a real pleasure and honor uh, to be invited to give these uh, lectures. And when I was uh, invited about a month ago, I was slightly apprehensive because I just had heard uh, Ingo's uh, Dean's lecture, and those of you who have been to Dean's uh, Ingo's lecture or have seen the video, you know like how philosophical his talk was. So, 
So when I was preparing my talk, I thought maybe I need to discuss more about the philosophy because that's the culture here. But at the middle of it, I had to give it up because I thought like I really cannot compete with Ingo. And, but that doesn't mean that you know, there, are not, you know, there are many philosophical issues you can discuss around this topic, that what is the role of uh, precision prevention in, in, in public health. And, but I'll leave those discussions maybe later, and especially when we are at the reception maybe, because I think we are all better philosophers when we are drinking. So anyway, so, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, develop some work which we have been doing, again, with a lot of people in collaboration and development and application of polygenic risk stratification models for uh, precision prevention. And so I'll try to first define a little bit about what is uh, precision prevention. So those of you who have no, obviously have seen everybody of you that uh, learn about the precision medicine initiative and the precision medicine cohort that was announced by Obama and then Francis Collins. And so, you know, it's, it's an emerging approach for disease prevention, and that's the focus is going to be today's, is the focus on the prevention that takes into account people's individual variation in genes, environment, and, and, and lifestyle. And, and this aligns very well with the Johns Hopkins Individualized Health Initiative also, that is, uh, that is also the goal is to uh, combine clinical, genetic, and lifestyle, and other data sources to create innovative tools intended to improve decision-making in the prevention and treatment of a range of conditions. So to be a little bit more concrete, I work on a lot on uh, breast cancer. So to see like, you know, what might be a particular uh, application of precision prevention, I'll go through this uh, like, you know, one example. So if you think about a disease like uh, breast cancer, which is a very relatively common disease in Caucasian populations, including US, and is becoming an emergingly global problem even in developing uh, countries. So even if you take an average uh, woman in the US, the, it's li her lifetime risk over, let's say, cumulative risk between 30 and 80 is about 12%. Uh, it's a pretty high number, but it's sort of, you know, everybody has been clumped into one average risk. What we would like to do is, like, you know, if we understand the, what are the risk factors of breast cancer, the genetic factors and lifestyle factors, other biomarkers, maybe one day we can develop a model that will allow to sort of assign in more individualized risk based on their risk factors that will give you more of a spread, like you know, around the 12%. Some people might be at higher risk, some people might be lower risk. And then if we could do that, maybe we'll be able to stratify the population into distinct categories of risk for which the recommendation for what kind of uh, preventive effort they might do might be different. So for example, people who are at, let's say, the average or near average or lower than average risk, they might be recommended a routine mammography screening uh, you can tailor that to maybe a little bit of the risk estimates because there's a big range of risk. In the next category, who are sort of higher, but not very high, they might consider more intense uh, approach, like, you know, for example, they might be more intensely counseled for making lifestyle changes. They might consider more frequent mammograms, and, and they might even consider preventive therapies, like in taking tamoxifen, you know, for preventing uh, breast cancer. And then people who are at the very high risk, like they might consider even more intensive things like, uh, like you know, enhanced surveillance uh, through MRI, taking preventive therapy, and even you know, people who are at very, very high risk, they might consider risk-reducing surgery like mastectomy, which is obviously not people who are at moderate risk they should not uh, consider because all of these things have you know, uh, har harms and benefits. So, so there is a long way from going from discovery, uh, that is what you know, a lot of the time we are focusing on, to you know, biomarkers, risk factors, genetic factors to actually making this towards going towards uh, prevention, the precision prevention. And, and there are every, every step of the way, there are many interesting methodological issues because there are very quantitative issues. And obviously, we, I will not be able to talk about all of these things in today's talk. But we, I give a you know, general overview of these you know, the various methodological issues in these various steps in this paper, which just today became online available. So if you want to uh, look at it, it's a kind of a nice coincidence. And so anyway, I have highlighted three areas which I'm going to focus on today's talk. One is that how to develop polygenic risk score using data from genome-wide association studies, synthesizing information from multiple data sources on the methodologic side. And then uh, towards the end, I'm going to talk about a particular application uh, using a breast cancer model that we have developed and how that could be potentially useful for certain clinical applications. So before I go into some of the details, it's useful to take a step back and you know, let's think about a general framework that we are uh, considering. 
So we are trying to predict individuals' future risk of the disease. We are not trying to predict the probability that you know, somebody at the current population has the disease. We are trying to predict individuals' future risk of the disease who are currently healthy. So for that kind of modeling, it's useful to think about modeling risk in terms of disease incidence. And the good old proportional hazard model, like you know, that are used for modeling you know, in clinical trial and, you know, age, uh, and, has, and, and disease incidence, is still very useful. So you know you have a think of it as a hazard of the new disease over a future in you know, a future age, given a set of risk factors that is in this kind of model typically specified as a baseline hazard times the effect of some of those risk factors in a multiplicative scale. You can generalize this model to account for more interaction between age and the risk factors and various different ways. So so and and, and you can start estimating that if you have a cohort study like in a prospective cohort studies where healthy individuals are being followed up over time for observing their future disease incidence, you can start fitting these kind of models to estimate these parameters and you know, start building this model. But, uh, and, but the good thing about it is that even, even if you do not have cohort studies, you have case control studies, you can, there are theory that says that the, the, sort of the kind of, if you have well-designed case control studies that samples incident cases that arise in the future, that, uh, and, and you do like kind of estimate the odds ratio logistic regression type of parameters, those are gives approximations of these the, the, the incidence ratios parameters. So, so the main thing is that you can use both cohort studies and case control studies to start building uh, this kind of uh, models. And then, you know, then once you have developed this kind of model, you can actually start, you know, developing a model for absolute risk, which is going to be the, really the emphasis of today's talk. And the definition of absolute risk is that what is the probability that a healthy individual who is currently healthy they will develop the disease over a specified age interval in the future. So those are the kind of probabilities we are interested in when, when a woman is trying to make a decision, for example, whether and how, when they should start screening. And that should be based on this kind of uh, risk calculation. And those kind of absolute risks could be now related to the, the, the model I just showed, which is the proportional hazard type of model that we are working with, you know, just through some stand survival analysis calculations, which also takes into account for the you know, competing risk of mortality from other causes, for example, if you are trying to predict somebody's prostate cancer risk when they're 75, you know, they might die from, you know, in the next 10 years, they might die from heart disease. So that should bring down their absolute risk from dying from uh, prostate cancer. So, so this kind of calculation takes into account the, the, the competing cause of mortality as well. And this is very standard. I'm not saying anything new. This kind of in, uh, calculation has been taken into account in a lot of standard risk models. For example, the well-known uh, Gale model that has been developed by my colleague at the National Cancer Institute, Mitch Gale, for predicting absolute risk of uh, breast cancer. Okay, so so that's sort of the you know general framework on mine. Now I'm going to talk about you know how do you take you know incorporate information from the 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 SNPs that are being associated with complex diseases from genome and association studies through this approach of developing this polygenic uh, risk score. So starting out, breast cancer, like any other complex diseases, are going to be highly polygenic. And before the era of genome association studies, through studies of highly affected families and linkage studies, researchers had identified you know, rare variants which are highly penetrant. That means they are, the risk, if you have the variant, it's rare in the general population, but once you have the variant, the risk is very high. Those have been identified, like BRCA1 and 2 genes, famous, and there are a few other variants like that. But in the last 10 years, the focus has been through the, these genomide association studies, which tries to identify variants which are generally more common in the general population, typically frequency more than 5% or so in the general population. And they typically confer much more modest risk. Like if you have one of these variants, their risk does not go by tenfold or fivefold. It's going by maybe 20% or even 10%. But there are many more of them that have been already found, okay? And so although each individually only confers a modest risk, in combination, they can start imposing a stronger, a stronger risk. So what is a polygenic risk score? So this is a risk score for individuals that captures the total genetic burden associated with the disease over many different variants across multiple locus. And so that's sort of, you know, you can think about instead of having a variant yes or no, it becomes more like a continuous score which counts the, the genetic load you carry over multiple different uh, with, uh, common variants. So like for example, if you have a genome association studies, a one very simple uh, way of constructing this polygenic risk score is for example, to take the SNPs that reaches clearly the, the threshold for discovery, which is the genome significance, like sometimes it's used at five times 10 to the power minus eight, 
and then you take a sum of the you know, genotype values of what these, all those SNPs which has reached this genome-wide significance, and you have to focus on independent SNPs, otherwise it can cause actually noise. And then you weight those, you know, the, you take a weighted sum where the weight is based on the, the strength of the association of the disease. If the if SNP is more strongly associated, then you want to upweight the SNP. If it's more weakly associated, you want to downweight the, uh, the SNPs. And, and this idea how to improve this polygenic risk score construction itself is a very active idea of methodological research because it's a very simple-minded method. And you can think about how to further improve it. I'm going to touch upon a little bit about, you know, like some methodological work which we have been doing. But, uh, you know, but, but it is an interesting uh, statistical and, you know, um, problem. But I'll focus on, for most of my talk, like having, using this kind of simple polygenic risk score that is very commonly uh, used. <coughs> so to understand what is the actual potential of this kind of polygenic risk score for uh, risk stratification or risk prediction, it is useful to understand what is the connection of this polygenic risk score and concepts of heritability. So, so one way of thinking about heritability is that the, it is a variability. So for each disease, you think about there is an underlying true polygenic risk score that is defined by the combination of all the genetic variants that are actually associated with the disease. And you know, by that, that would be like, you know, that we do not know the true polygenic risk score, but you can theoretically think about there is a true polygenic risk score. And there may be, there may be a lot of some common variants that is defining the risk. There might be some less common and rare variants. There might be some interactions. And all of these things together defines the true genetic risk. And the variation of that true genetic risk in the population, that is a concept of heritability. That more variation you have for this distribution, that means the disease is more heritable because it's explaining more of the disease variation by the genetics. And this concept actually can be related to more standard concept of familial risk, like for example, sibling risk or first degree familial risk. If there's a mathematical relationship between the, the, this concept of heritability, which is the variation of the distribution of the true polygenic risk score and uh, in the concepts of familial uh, relative risk. And in fact, you can show that, the, that, that again, if you, if you could measure the true genetic risk for, for, an, for an individual, and, and then and if you, this is the heritability that's the spread of the distribution, and if you use that model, uh, that genetic risk, to discriminate like the cases and controls, the separation between the cases and controls based on this risk score is going to be also driven by the, by the heritability. So more heritable, that means you'll be able to use that genetic risk score, the true genetic risk score, to better separate the cases and controls if you're doing disease prediction. An interesting thing is that, again, so but there are components of heritability, because part of the heritability will be due to common variants, rare variants, the interactions. And very interesting thing is that, you know, because of work, pioneering work like people like Peter Vischer, who was visiting a couple of weeks ago, they have defined methodology that allows to estimate how much of the variation of the risk of a disease could be explained by not only the SNPs that have reached the, you know, the genome-wide significance that are considered discovered, that like the 94 SNPs, but also like including all of the SNPs that are included in the GWAS platform. That is like, you know, that, that shows that, you know, what is the potential of this approach to further explain uh, disease risk variation. So not only the things that have reached the genome-wide significance, but in addition, as we do larger study, where we could uh, go. So, so to illustrate that point, so, uh, so I'll show you some results from a paper we published uh, last year. So here, we basically applied the kind of techniques developed by Vischer and his, um, his uh, group across uh, data from uh, 13 different cancer types. That was all data from generated at the Genome-wide Association study generated at the National Cancer Institute. And so for the first half of the table, or, the, or the, up to this part, these are basically estimates of familial risk, the first degree relative familial risk from different type of uh, twin registries and family studies. So just to keep a focus on something, like a fix, let's fix on the uh, column of the U Utah family registry. That, that shows that the, you know, for example, this 1.8 means that according to that, at least estimate based on the registry, that if you have a brother with bladder cancer, then the somebody's risk or bladder cancer goes up by uh, 1.8 fold compared to the general population. And what I'm showing here is the, the how much heritability we can explain based on the genome -wide association study SNP chips that include like a few hundred thousand SNPs that are included in the, in the study. So in general, you would expect this number to be less than this, right? Because these all include not only the contribution of the common variants that are included in the GWAS platform, they also should include the rare variants, uh, interaction effects and other type of, and you know, there could be some biases as well. Uh, and, and, but, and you see that you know, these are numbers are generally less, but you see that across all different cancer, there is substantial heritability explained 
by common variance alone. So you know, typically the, the familial risk, for example, is ranging around 1.2 to 1.5. There are a few exceptions, like, you know, like for example, osteosarcoma, which has a very strong familial risk based on common variance. Uh, uh, chronic lymphoid leukemia is more than two. And another one exception was like, testicular cancer. Those are like a little bit hard on the higher side. But you can see that you know, across all cancers, it does the common variance is going to explain a substantial amount of heritability. And then what we looked at is that in this table, what I'm showing is that the same estimate of the GUAS heritability that I showed in the last table in the last column, but in a slightly different scale, because this is the liability threshold scale that population genetics people like to use. But you can think of it as just a one-to-one -one, uh, transformation of those things. And so that's the GUAS heritability. And what I'm showing here is that if I now take out the SNPs, and the regions that are considered already found to be associated with those cancers that are considered to be, have been discovered. And those, that gives an idea how much more we can potentially explain in the future. And if you look at the difference between the, these numbers, it's only seen, you'll see that it's only about average, we have explained only about 10% of the, the heritability, the GWAS heritability, based on the SNPs that have been uh, discovered so far. So that means that you know, in the future, as we do larger and larger study, we will be able to, just using the GWAS data alone, we should be ex able to explain more heritability. And, and to make it about the point a little bit more clear, let's take an, one example. This is an example of uh, breast cancer. So here we have estimated, I should have uh, put a number here, that the, the, the GWAS familial risk, that means if you, the, if you take the common variants that are included in standard GWAS platform, they should be able to explain about a familial risk about 1.4, the uh, familial risk. And, and so and we have developed method in these uh, papers. What we have shown that not only in using GWAS data, you can estimate what is the total uh, heritability due to the common variant, but what is their likely effect size distribution. That means that you know, how many SNPs are actually associated, likely to be associated with the, with the disease. And we estimate that, that, again, using empirical data and with some modeling, that there might be, for breast cancer, you might need about 4,000 SNPs to explain that you know, 1.4 uh, familial uh, risk. And, and, and this is not unique to our study. A lot of people, other people who have done effect size distribution estimation, they are finding over many, over many diseases that the genetic architecture is like very, very polygenic for diseases like breast cancer, type 2 diabetes, people are estimating thousands of uh, susceptibility variants. For more complex disease, if you look at the psychiatric disorder, they are finding it could be tens of thousands of susceptibility variants that are each contributing very small amount of risk, but it, together, they are explaining a lot of variation of risk in the general uh, population. So what I'm showing here is that the sort of there is the you know estimated effect size distributions in terms of the odds ratio. So you can see there are few SNPs which has large effect, relatively large effect, like you know 1.2 odds ratio, 1.15 odds ratios, and there are more and more SNPs which has smaller and smaller effects, that according to our estimates. And what I'm showing here is the power curve of discovering these SNPs with case control studies of different sample size. Okay, so let's think about the gray line. So this is the power curve for the a study of 60,000 cases and 60,000 control. And why did I choose that number? Because that is the effective sample size of the largest GWAS of breast cancer that has taken two place. So you can see that from this curve, that that study has already discovered all that we had to discover for that a SNP that has an odds ratio, for example, greater than, let's say, 1.05. And, and it has discovered some in this range but it has missed all of these SNPs because its powers are zero. And, and if we increase the sample size from like for 60,000 to 200,000 cases and controls, we'll start discovering many more of those. And in this side, what I'm showing is that if we now start putting these SNPs into a risk prediction model, how the, the, you know, the for example, the area under the curve of, you know, of risk discrimination is going to improve with the, with, the, with the sample size. And the main thing you'll notice is that, that this performance of the model goes up, but it goes up slowly as we, you know, as we increase the sample slice. It's a gradual increase, but the potential to improve the genetic risk prediction model, which is the limit is the red line, which is correspond to the heritability, that is substantial. And, 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 and this is really happens due to the very polygenic nature of the disease. So to just to make the point that, that that's a very important point, but suppose the disease was slightly less polygenic. It's still polygenic, but the same amount of heritability could be explained by, a, let's say, 1,000 SNPs instead of 4,000 SNPs. So what would happen? Then you'll expect that there are, you know, the, the, the effect size distribution will be shifted more towards the bigger effects. To explain the same amount of variation, but you know, with the less number of SNPs, on average, the effect size has to be bigger. And then what would happen is that you will discover these things much faster, 
as a function of the sample size, and then you will reach the limit at, at a much faster rate. And you know that that you will like after reaching the sample size of 200,000 cases and controls, you'll basically reach a plateau. That means you do not need to consider even larger study to improve the prediction model. You'll probably get by that time, you know, whatever you, the juice you could get from these kind of studies. But because of the highly more polygenic nature of the disease, we actually have to keep going even after 200,000, up to let's say 500,000, where things start reaching a plateau for this disease at least. Okay, so the main take home message from this that is that, that think about there's a true instrument that we cannot observe, that is a true genetic risk defined by a effect of common variants, rare variants, interactions. I have left out the interactions because so far we have not seen much evidence of interactions, but there could be some contribution of interactions. And think about in a given study, you can only construct an imperfect instrument. That is an estimate of the true genetic risk. And why is it imperfect now? Because first of all, we are missing the contribution of the rare variants because we have not done the you know, sequencing studies and things like that in a large scale yet. And, but even for common variants, we cannot estimate their effects for the, of each variant perfectly because of the statistical imprecision. You know, whatever very large data set we have, we still have uncertainty in estimating these small effects, which are near zero, but we would like to have a very tight confidence intervals around, that, uh, around those effect sizes. So as a result, we fall short. We cannot reach the limit with the current uh, sample sizes. So in the future, we'll need very large sample sizes, whole genome sequencing to get to the, you know, the contribution of the rare variants. Hopefully, some good functional annotation data could also help to prioritize the SNPs, because so far what I'm talking about is based on all agnostic approach that we treat all SNPs equally. But if there is a better way of prioritizing SNPs, that might improve the risk prediction. I'm going to give an, one example. And then we need robust statistical method to put all of this information uh, together. So just to make the point, like, you know, that the, again, going back to the issue that you know, we talked about, there are a lot of interesting statistical issues about how to construct better polygenic risk scores using the GWAS data. So this is an example we have taken from this paper uh, that is submitted, uh, also available in the bioarchive. Here I'm showing a result not for breast cancer, this is for type 2 diabetes. And what I'm showing is that, uh, again, we have taken very G large GWAS data to build a polygenic risk score model for type 2 diabetes, and then I've tried to predict assess the ability of the model to predict type 2 diabetes status in an independent sample. So the R square, what I'm showing is that the prediction R square in an independent sample. So what I'm showing here is that the, you know, like here, suppose I choose SNPs based on, in the model, not based on genome-wide significance, but with different threshold. You know, I can potentially, let's say, relax the threshold from genome-wide significant to more liberal. And then, corresponding to this different threshold, I, I'm looking at the what is that prediction R square in the independent sample. And the blue line shows that, you know, if you do the naive thing, like, you know, that people are using that, you know, they just take the, those SNPs and then just take the uncorrected estimate of effect size from the, from the study. And then the, and the red line shows that it is a corrected estimate effect, like tax adjustment for this concept called winner scars, which is basically what a lasso type of algorithm does. And you can see that the, basically, you know, first of all, the, those kind of winner scars correction helps. And, and the optimal threshold is not actually genomic significant. You actually can improve the performance of these models by taking more liberal uh, significance threshold. And that makes sense because we know that there are more heritability to be explained beyond the genome wide significant SNPs. And we are seeing some evidence of that. And, and then what I'm showing here is that we, saw, we had this idea that suppose now we have now categorized the SNP into, let's say, two categories. One we consider which are more likely to be associated with type 2 diabetes because of various uh, an analysis we have done, looked into other databases of the association of the SNPs with the expressions, methylations, histone modifications in the right tissues. We have done a large amount of work to map this, you know, this for various diseases to this potentially what we consider more informative SNPs. And suppose we can partition this, like, you know, this more informative or high prior SNPs and the rest of the SNPs. And then we said, okay, if I, my information is good, then I should be able to use two different thresholds for inclusion of the SNPs from the two different categories. So this is the threshold I'm using for the high priority SNPs, and this is the threshold for the rest of the genome. And then let us empirically see that what combination of the thresholds gives the best performance in the independent data sets. And what we see, first of all, is that, that we, we could improve compared to the best performing model if we did not discriminate between the two sets of SNPs. We do have to see some improvement in the prediction R square. And, and that optimal combination that gives the best performing model is what you would expect if the, your priority is good. That is, a, the threshold you get for the, the high priority SNP is more liberal than the, and the, than the low priority SNPs. So basically, if you're a Bayesian, that's what you would expect. And if your priority is correct, 
then you know then the, 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 the threshold for significance should be lower that you know for when you are putting in the model and and that's what you empirically seen that that this probably this this information is giving some good information about the disease association and that's why it's when you are doing this empirically you do see that yes you are, you can is a little lower threshold for selecting this uh, for putting this high priority sleep into the model and as a result of that you are seeing some improvement now having said that I'll have to admit that this is our best example. We have tried this across 10 different diseases. We have like scanned across all kind of you know, genomic databases to extract this information, to make it, you know, to come up with this list of high priority SNPs. There's a lot of work, but you know, we, have, we haven't seen this kind of improvement for a lot of other diseases. So, so it, we found it was kind of challenging that, you know, that even though we see a lot of enrichment in the association signal, but to translate that in terms of risk, like substantial improvement in risk prediction was hard. And so, so that's sort of, you know, that, that's, the, that's the what we have found so far. So, so now I'm going to move into the, the, the second uh, topic, which is like the synthesizing information from multiple data sources. <coughs> so uh, because I'm moving on to the, you know, the second part, if I, I can take a quick question if you have uh, at this point, just to take a little pause. Okay, so so the next step is like okay, I have the polygenic risk factors, but you know if you are considering a, like you know chronic diseases like heart disease, cancer, they have all epidemiologic risk factors. You know that uh, we know. So that we have to put all of these factors together: the genetic factors, epidemiologic risk factors, other type of biomarkers like you know, epigenetic factors, which could be mediators to into into the one single model. So we have to assess risk in a multivariate model, not one at a time. And you know because we want to evaluate confounding, we want to evaluate mediation. We want to evaluate interactions between gene, gene, gene environment, you know, bio, gene biomarker, and all possible type of interactions. So basically, you know, you need to start in a multivariate model setting. But but the challenge is that sometimes we, we do not have this one single huge study that has the best information on all the risk factors we want to study. Different studies have different strength, and so this is what we are facing all the time. That you know, it's not that you know there is a one study that is big enough that we think that it will give precise estimate, but that has also has information on all the risk factors. So what we have is more like this kind of situations. That we might have some very big data sources, like for example, that might come from like, you know, mega conversia, population registries, healthcare databases, they are huge in, in sample size. But they may not have all the relevant variants, variables that you might want to put into the model. And you can you know, extract the data, or you can even use the, you know, fit a model to the data, and you know, it might be much more convenient that instead of getting the data, you can extract parameters of those model as a sort of, a kind of getting transporting information from the data instead of the data itself. But then we have our own analytic studies, which we epidemiologists have carefully designed to study you know, the risk factors we want to study, including good biomarkers and things like that. And, and you know, because they want to address specific hypotheses of interest, but they may not be sometimes as large as the, as the, this, the studies you might get. So one of the questions we try to uh, think about is in a, in, a, in a general way, is that is there a way to combine the strength of these kind of studies, the analytic studies which has very detailed information, but maybe on a smaller number of people, with a big information from big data sources, which has a more of a information on a, more of a much more subset of the variables, but it has much more precise information. And that could improve generalizability of the model and increase efficiency of the parameter estimates. So, so the, I promise that the next two slides are the, my only slides which are going to be mathematical. But so bear with me, and because after that I'm going to be much more applied. But I had to, you know, because I'm trained in a, as a mathematical statistician from Indian Statistical Institute, so I thought I have to, you know, present something there. But I, I try to make it easier. So. So here is the like the, the methodology we have developed, which I, I really like, is you know that's the geometric view of what we have done. So typically, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to develop a predictive model of a, a predict an outcome y given a set of risk factors x and z. And you know we have a parametric model, and typically that we try to fit a model in this space because you know we have data, analytic studies, and use standard maximum likelihood or estimate equation approach or whatever. This is our standard practice currently. But now suppose somebody has from an external big data sources, somebody has fitted a reduced model. That means they have, have developed a model for predicting y based on a subset of the risk factors, which in this case is x. Okay? And that, that has an own parametric model, 
And you know, and maybe that you know, nobody has given me the data, but they have given me the what is the parameter estimate from that big big model. That, so the model fitted to the big data, which is a reduced model fitted to the big data. So the question is, how do I in take advantage of this information when I'm trying to do it, make inference on this on this space? So, so here is what the, our view is that so there is a true parameter that is generating the true probability distribution of the data, and that's what we are trying to estimate, and that's what we'd like to get an estimate of the parameters. But that gives a like if you think about that that true probability distribution, uh, if you project it to the the, the the reduced model space, that gives us a corresponding true probability distribution for the in the reduced model space. And what I have is that and that that model the true pro, when you project this from here to here that probabilities may not belong to the parametric family of models that have been considered in the past, but that's still okay. okay? But what we know is that, that, you know, that, that the, if, if somebody has done a maximum likelihood estimation, there is a nice theory of like, how, what does the property of maximum likelihood estimation under the misspecification of the model that says that, that whatever the parameter estimate that they have gotten, that should sort of minimize in some sense the distance between this space and the true distribution, but the true distribution is the projection of this distribution to the lower that, that, that space. So the basic idea is that that means that you, know, you can put the, all this geometry I said, you can put it as a mathematical constraint on the, on, this, on the parameters of this model. And we have found a general way of you know, sort of identifying this constraint or whatever the geometry I said, there's a mathematical way of writing down the constraint. So this is the standard inference we do, likelihood-based inference. This is, a, this is the likelihood of your data. If you have ascertainment, you know, like for example, case control ascertainment of your genetic studies, you have a little bit more complicated likelihood in the denominator, but that's the standard inference we are doing now. Okay, but now we can bring in this constraint from the information using information from the external big data sources to make those inferences potentially more efficient. And so I'm not going to like you know I'm not going to like again here's the, like what kind of efficiency again we are talking about. So again, a very toy example. Suppose we have you know like a case control study of thousand cases and thousand control. It's your own study, and you have a very refined measurements of your exposure. That is, you know, that is uh, the actual causal factor for the uh, for the disease, and that's the association you are trying to estimate. So, what is the effect of the X on the risk of the disease? But suppose Z, a much poor instrument for measuring the same exposure, that could be measured on a lot of people, like for example, very big big studies. And I have the information on the association of the that poor instrument and the and the disease. Okay, and that information, if I if I could use, and this shows the you know that if I what if like if I did an analysis of disease and the refined exposure using only my study, that's the precision we are getting, and potentially if we had the, actually we could use the information on the association of the disease and the, the poor instrument that comes from a very big studies, like you know, very, very large studies so that almost there is no, uh, you know, no imprecision, you could you know, really gain the efficiency uh, by considering that external uh, information. But again, it's a very toy example. In the, in the paper, there are more real examples, and, and, and so, so, but there are, you know, obviously many caveats which probably already you can think about is that, okay, you have to make assumptions when you want to do it. You have to assume that are, the populations are exchangeable in certain sense. Otherwise, how are you going to borrow strength from another populations? We have methods that could account for different in distribution of the risk factors or covariates between the populations. Uh, if you have an estimate of those distributions from that external population, so we could handle that. Um, but, you know, but if somebody might argue that even the risk model itself could be different between two populations. And then, you know, what are you trying to estimate? Is it the parameters associated with the external population, or do you want to estimate the parameters associated with the internal population? So there are a lot of interesting issues comes up, and actually that uh, the paper I referred that has a nice discussion uh, following that paper that has you know, brought up some of those discussions. So if you are interested, I would, I, you know, I'm happy to forward you a, a copy of that paper. So, so that brings me down to the, the last topic, which is like now really I'm going to talk about a particular application that has you know, basically borrowed some of the methodological ideas, which I just showed over the, you know, the different topics, to developing a model for a risk prediction for breast cancer, and, and, and really thinking about how this model could be useful for uh, pre uh, precision uh, prevention. And this paper uh, it should uh, soon appear in the, in the uh, I think, at the end of May, it should appear. And this was led by a, actually a PhD student from Johns Hopkins, Paige Mass. Uh, she was a PhD student here, and she was being uh, uh, co-mentored by me when I was at NCI. And this was a, it took a long time, almost three years, to develop this project because it involved getting data from many different uh, studies. But it's really nice to see that you know, this paper is going to see the light uh, of the day soon. 
So as you remember this figure, that breast cancer is highly uh, polygenic. It has been uh, through affected family studies and linkage studies you know, in the, before the GWAS era that has led to identification of these rare high penetrant variants. And, and then more recently, genome-wide association studies have led to the identification of common variants, which each of which has modest effect. So we are developing models for the general population, for predicting risk in the general population, where these mutations are quite rare. So our focus is to use the, this kind of SNP information to predict risk for an average woman in the general population, whereas there are a model which tries to predict risk in a high-risk clinic setting that they does have to take into account the BRC1 and 2 mutation because there it will be much more, much more common. So our focus is to a development of risk model that could be applied to more general population where uh, these SNPs will be contributing to variation in risk substantially. And, and but then, as I said, like in you know, a breast cancer, like other chronic disease, they have obviously a lot of other epidemiology risk factors, environmental factors, you know, and then um, anthropometric factors, and, and then um, lifestyle factors that ha that we try to take into account depending on what information uh, we had available. And those risk factors are defined at different uh, stages of their life. Some are at adolescence, adult premenopause, adult postmenopause. And, and so there are various types of risk factors are, uh, for breast cancer. So, so we, we included this, this set of risk factors, like you know, one set of risk factors, what we considered, they're non-modifiable. That means in the sense that, for example, the, the SNP information, the, the genetics may not be mod not modifiable. A family history is not modifiable. Some anthropometric factor, like height, is already defined, which we should not consider modifiable anymore. And, you know, and then there are a few other reproductive risk factors which we considered, put them in the category of non-modifiable in the sense that women is not going to modify their probably, you know, the, those kind of things based on their breast cancer risk. There could be other factors into consideration when they're uh, deciding about the number of children they want to have, when they want to have the first children, and so on. So we put them in the categories of non-modifiable risk factors. And then we consider a number of lifestyle risk factors. They are women, you know, they are considered potentially modifiable. Uh, like you know, like BMI, uh, alcohol consumption, uh, um, taking hormone replacement therapy, which has been you know like a, a risk factor for breast cancer, and 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 smoking. So so this is basically you know that what happened in developing this model. So again, as I said, like in the beginning, like you know that to develop this kind of model, you really do not have all the in best information on a single study. You have to combine information from multiple different uh, sources. So here are the different sources. So we have a big data set, which is from the a nested case control set of nested case control studies from the consortium of these big cohort studies, the breast, prostate, and colorectal cancer cohort studies, which gave us data on 17,000 cases and 20,000 control. It's pretty big. Uh, it has a lot of the epidemiology risk factors we wanted to include, uh, and a subset of the SNPs, about the 24 SNPs that had been uh, genotyped in this, um, uh, in this uh, cohort, and those were available to us. And using that data, we did a lot of detailed modeling of the multivariate risk of the epidemiology risk factors, but we also explored the interaction between the risk factors and those selected SNPs, the 24 SNPs that have been genotyped, and we did not find evidence of uh, interaction in the sense the effect seems quite multiplicative. The, the effect of the SNPs with respect to each other and the risk factor, they seem to be pretty multiply uh, nicely. And then we wanted to include more SNPs because there have been a lot more SNPs has been available, and you know, and there are 68 additional SNPs that have been identified to be associated with the risk of breast cancer. So what we did was that we took the published estimates of odds ratios that are available from the literature, and then if you make certain assumptions that, for example, there is no interactions between these SNPs and the other SNPs and that SNP and the risk factors, and, and then there is no correlation between that these SNPs are not associated with the epidemiology risk factors, then you can start developing the model in a sort of synthetic way. That means you can take the odds ratio information to build the model, including these additional steps. And we think the assumptions are reasonable because there are other papers. We could not do it because we did not have the genotype data on these 68 SNPs on this particular study, but there are other studies which has investigated the interaction between these SNPs and these same, same set of epidemiology risk factors. And they have also suggested that there is not much evidence of non-multiplicative uh, effects. And then we basically use a combination of other population-based data sets, like you know, the cancer incidence rate that are available in the general population from SEER, rate of competing mortality. Remember, we told you that you know, in the absolute risk model, we need to account for the risk of death from other causes, other than the primary causes you are looking at. You know, that might reduce the absolute risk. And then we also use the information on the distribution of the risk factors in the general population that is available from like national surveys, for example, that are maintained by, let's say, CDC, like the National Health Interview Survey and National Health, uh, uh, these two surveys, we, we use combined data set from these two things. So this allows us to project risk for the general population. 
because we are getting a you know, representative distribution of the risk factors, and we know the allele frequency of the SNPs for the general population that allows us to project risk for the general population. So all of this information gone on to develop this model, and now I'm going to show like, you know, what we found. So, so now I'm going to show a series of figures that shows that, remember I sort of tried to, in the beginning of my talk, like, and I tried to show like, you know, how I would like to develop a model so that we can assign individuals risk, and I would like to see a good spread of that risk above the, around the average. And so this is like the spread you know, of, the, uh, of the risk we get if we develop the model just based on the traditional epidemiologic factors. So you can see that again, the, because we have calibrated it to the general population, the average is going to be maintained at that 11% or 12% risk, because that's you know, that, that we have uh, calibrated. And then you see some spread, not a lot of spread. For example, using this model, we can identify some women who have, let's say, the lifetime risk, which is defined as cumulative risk between 30 and 80, is above 20% compared to like an 11% average risk. Now, if we just develop a model including the, the SNPs alone, then you see that you actually get a better stratification compared to the just using the epidemiologic factors. And you know, that you, you now start identifying, for example, some individuals who are at risk higher than 25% uh, in, the, in the general population, a significant fraction of the uh, population. And you see that the now the tail, in the, you are being able to identify more people in the tail, which is very important, because those are the people who will be most influenced by the risk estimate, because they are the one who is going to take more intensive intervention uh, effort. And then if you put them uh, both together, then you again see the slightly more fattening of the tail. Now you start identifying a small fraction of the population who are, let's suppose, lifetime risk is above uh, 30%. So you know, they can, if you remember that those risk categories I tried to define in the beginning, so you know, this kind of classification might push some people to the, the higher, higher uh, categories. But so that's sort of, you know, so that shows the general thing, like the, what is the stratification we are getting. But now let's get to be more concrete, that suppose now I think of a particular application. Let's suppose, you know, we, can we use this kind of model, or if we try to use this model for deciding when a woman might be recommended for screening, as opposed to the, following the current guideline, which is simply based on age. So for example, in the US, currently the guideline for starting mammographic screening is considered age 50. And, and actually for many diseases and many cancer, age is the use as the, the threshold for screening. But why do we use age? Because age is the strongest risk factor for many chronic diseases. And that's a, the best risk marker we have. But age is not the only risk factor. There could be other risk factors. And the question is that if we use a risk-based approach, which is going to be more coherent, instead of the age, how much things will change? So that's what we wanted to add, uh, answer you know, using this model. So what I'm ask, asking this question in this table is that suppose we give this model to estimate you know, to risk for 100,000 women in the general uh, population, OK? And let's focus on the third and the fourth row. So what I'm showing is that, that if, I, if I assess the risk for 100,000 women who are currently at age 40, how many people's risk, the 10-year risk, is going to be an av over an average 50-year-old woman's risk? Why am I using 50? Because 50 is the current recommendation for screening, right? So you can think about if you are coherent, if you can find some woman who has less a family history and high genetic risk, and who are at age 40, their risk is looked like an average 50-year-old woman. Then based on a risk-based approach, they should be recommended for screening. And the question I'm asking is that how many people we can identify based on this kind of modeling? So you can see that the, if you use a full model of the SNP and risk factors, out of the 100,000 people, about 16% of that population who are at 40, they should be recommended for screening because their risk is actually like a 50-year-old woman. And if I ask the other question, like, you know, how many, if we assess the risk for a 50-year-old woman and how many of them are actually risk is like a 40-year-old woman, that means they are actually lower risk, and you'll see that, that that fraction is even larger. That's almost like, you know, one-third of the population who are currently at age 50, but their risk is actually like, you know, at a 40-year-old at woman. And so, and this final column shows, like, you know, for example, if you do this 16,000 additional screening, how many cases we'll capture? Okay, so we'll capture about 600 cases. The number is still small because, you know, the, the probability of developing breast cancer in the next 10 years is still a small number. So that's why. But you, by doing this additional screening for this 40-year woman, the 16,000 woman, you might get this 600. You can capture 600 additional cases. So the cost benefit will really depend on a lot on the also the how much cost. It, you know, it involves to assess the model. For example, if the genetic testing is too expensive, then to do this additional screening and then to save this many, that, to, uh, maybe additional diagrams, 50, 500, 600 cases, to 
screen 100,000 women, that might be the cost benefit may not be that much. But if the genetic testing cost really drops, then this cost benefit might be actually like, you know, useful. And on the other side is that, you know, that if we screen 32,000 people, delay the screening for this, you know, this, this 50-year-old woman because their risk is low, and you know, there's a lot of people, and we'll, we'll obviously miss some cases, right? Because, we, because they could be potential diagnosis, so we'll miss some cases. But you see that, in a, that this is the number of cases we'll, we'll miss and, you know, by, by not screening those uh, this woman. So, so that's you know, one potential application. You can see that, you know, that they're using this model, although the, 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 it's, not that, it's not that the stratification is tremendous, but it's already that you can see that the, if you compare to the current age-based recommendation, if you use a risk-based recommendation, a lot of women's recommendation could potentially change. But of course, there are other considerations like the cost and ethical issues in terms of using genetics and things like that. But this shows the potential of things. And another thing we wanted to investigate is that the, 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 the part in terms of risk communications. So a lot of the factors that went into the risk model what we considered not modifiable, like for example, genetics and you know, like height and other factors. And so in terms of risk communication, we thought like, you know, that, you know if a woman finds out you know, they have a high genetic risk, right? And, and that's not itself is modifiable. But the question is that, you know, that, that how much of the risk could be modifiable due to the lifestyle factors? And, you know, and whether we can look into that more at an individual basis that is, that is defined based on their genetic uh, profile. So what we are do showing is that the, the absolute risk distributions in a little different way. So first we categorize like women uh, based on the deciles of their non-modifiable risk. A lot of it is defined by, for example, the, the, the polygenic risk score. Okay? So for example, if some woman gets genetic testing, they test for these 100 SNPs, and they come up with the risk, the genetic risk, and based on that, we can define Okay, somebody is a low risk, you know, the first deciles, the median deciles, or the high risk, okay? But that is the risk, they cannot do anything about it, right? And then what I, in that axis, this axis, what I'm showing is that within these categories, there are variation in risk because of their environmental factors, the lifestyle factors. But I'm showing how much variation is risk is there due to the, the four lifestyle factors we are considering within categories of this non-modifiable risk. And what is striking here is that, that you can see that, 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 that there's a lot more variation in risk due to the lifestyle factors among people who are due to high risk due to the, these genetics and other non-modifiable factors. So for example, I mean, these are the you know, people who are at the high genetic risk and, you know, and they are bad lifestyle, like you know, heavy drinker, smoking, obese, and using HRT. Compared to that, you know, if you have a, the best lifestyle, you have a very substantial spread in, the, in, the, in this risk. Like, and in fact, that even if you are at a high genetic risk, like the deciles, if you have the right lifestyle, you are kind of on the average, you know, you, you can achieve at the average, that is, what is the average risk for the, for the population. I mean, you will not be like these people, like who are lucky to be born with the best set of genes so that their risk is already low and they can further reduce it. But the, the point is that even people who have high genetic risk, they have even a higher potential to reduce in terms of absolute risk reduction to do the, you know, do the right thing and bring down their risk at the average uh, level. We think that there is a, some like a hopeful message here is that you know that the, this kind of communication might maybe more, you know helpful to motivate some people to make the right lifestyle choices. Although we know that everybody should make these lifestyle choices, but it, it, motivation is hard. But the question is that you know that this might be a way of communicating risk that could be uh, helpful. So anyway, so now I'm coming to the end of my talk. So you know we have developed a set of tools as part of this work so that you know these tools can be used by other people to develop these models for other diseases because we have compartmentalized in a way so that you know, like you can take information from relative risks from your favorite case control and cohort studies and synthesize that information with various other sources like you know, population-based instrument of disease incidence, rate of competing mortality, uh, distribution of risk factors, and you know, start building your own models for your favorite disease, like you know, heart disease, <laughs> kidney disease. If you, have, if you can come, you know, get this information from different pieces, this gives a place to build, us, build these models. And, and then, of course, another big component I, I do not have a talk is that you know, the one other thing, not only is it enough to build a model, you'll have to actually validate the model in the future studies. And so we are developing a component so that, that first of all, we are trying to validate our own model in the other, other population, the breast cancer model, but we are trying to develop a, a component of the package that will allow this uh, validation. So basically, we try to take a prospective cohort studies, estimate risk for each woman, we want to calculate expected cases, number of cases in different categories of risk, and then see how many observed cases you have in the cohort. And then see are the expected number of cases and observed number of cases are matching, and then we'll feel comfortable that yes, this is model is validating in independent uh, cohort studies. And so, so we are, so work is going on. Podichai Palchaduri, a new postdoc in the department, is actually working on this 
to develop the validation component. And so I think with that, I think I'm at the end of my talk, and it's really a team science effort. There are many, many people uh, to thank. These are just some of the key collaborators, and there are, behind this, there are dozens of collaborators from dozens of institutes all over the world, which has contributed data, ideas, and methods behind these projects. Thank you. Show uh, you know uh, the box plot to risk by you know for uh, explained by modifiable risk factors in women at at, uh, at at higher risk and you know in cardiovascular disease you see the same thing I've never seen it displayed that way that's that's uh, so that's really cool so let me just ask you as a non geneticist it, you know when 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 uh, somebody thinks about a gene causing disease w the hope is that you'll find a gene with a strong effect you will identify the gene product and then you'll get a drug right which and nobody will have to lose weight or exercise more. <laughs> uh, but, but when you have these, these very polygenic diseases, you treat it like an environmental risk factor in a sense, right? You know what I mean? It's the same, same approach. So you, 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 it's a great risk predictor. I'm wondering, is there any tools where you could take those SNPs and look at, at the gene products and, and aggregate them in a way that would give you insight into pathophysiology of disease? Yeah, and that's a great question, that, you know, that, and that's very important. And there are tools available, for example, like you know, the, the, now that we are finding the lot of SNPs for any given disease, so the obvious question is that are, do they cluster around some networks and pathways? Yeah. So even if each individual SNP may not be, provide great insight to the biology because they're not strong effects, mm -hmm. but if a lot of them cluster around a particular pathway or network, mm -hmm. that might suggest you know, like drug target kind of things for, mm -hmm. the, you know, for translation, that would be another potential translation. So yes, so there is a lot of work that is going on mm -hmm. in terms of how to take this information that you're finding and how to interpret that biologically, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the how, why is this associated, what pathway or what other intermediate variables, biomarkers that affects, mm -hmm. that, give, that can give, you know, more insight to the pathogenesis of the disease. But what, one thing I was trying to show that, you know, that, that, that slide that, you know, that does that help improve the risk prediction model? That means I want to use the genetics to predict that disease, right, right. and all this intermediate information, is it helpful? Sure, yeah. right? And we are not finding that, that from a risk prediction point of view, that you know, it, it has some use, but it was not tremendously helpful right. so, to so know I, the intermediate information. Right, so, so I, did I understand you to say you didn't find any gene-environment interactions when you look at, at the uh, detailed analytic study? Right, right. So, and again, you have to be careful when you say, what, is, what do you mean by interaction, in what scale? Okay, yeah. so we didn't find any evidence of non-multiplicative effects. So right. things were acting in a pretty multiplicative fashion, uh -huh. and I think that is the reason that you know when things act multiplicatively, and there is I mean, this is a well-known epidemiologic fact, yeah. Yeah. you expect the risk differences, yeah. right, to be heading, right. right, and and risk difference will be larger associated with one factor if yeah. the other factor is at a higher level of risk, right, and that is what we are seeing in this kind of box plot that you know, because things are multiplicative. That's why you see the environmental effects are larger in absolute risk scale mm -hmm. when your genetic risk is high. Right. Yeah, great. 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 Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yeah. So, please, uh, so uh, we, we tape these for a podcast. So, so I would ask you maybe to stand and use the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. This is Aravinda Chakravarti. Oh, you know, this is this is very nice. So, um, I'm just wondering. Um, how these kinds of analysis can really be extended, not so much only for morbidity, but for mortality. I would presume that what individuals really worry about is not only having breast cancer, but the immediate thought is, I'm going to die from breast cancer. Right. So much of the genetics has gone towards, that's why finding all these rare mutations that have exceptionally high risk. So. Um, do you know, or is there any way to look at and test as to whether the transition from morbidity to mortality is which of those risk factors affect them the most? Um, you know, reducing a 12% risk to a very low level or reducing everybody to a 12% risk is a big, you know, big step. But in trying to make it a much more chronic kind of illness that has happened with others in our, you know, lifetime. Is it possible that you could identify factors that would just lengthen that transition time? Right. So talking, I mean, so you can, you know, when you think about mortality, you can think about mortality by specific disease or, you know, overall mortality. So, 
So one thing I would say, like for at least for, again, I cannot talk in generality, but I know for cancer, the, it has been very hard to find SNPs that will predict survival after the disease. That I, I know a very few examples that, you know, because I think the treatment and things like that are so overwhelming there that it's very hard to find SNPs that are predicting survival among cancer patients. But if you just, for example, you're trying to predict somebody is healthy now, and you're trying to find what is the probability that person is going to die from breast cancer in the next 10 years, some of these will be predictive because this predict will pro pro predict that that person's incidence is going to be high, and that is going to lead to some mortality. So, so, so for a, from a healthy, like if somebody already has breast cancer, you're trying to predict survival, this thing is not going to be that effective. But if you're trying to person you know, predict somebody's risk, like okay, this person is healthy now, and what is the probability that in the next 10 years that person might die from breast cancer, this SNPs will be informative. But, but I do not know about other diseases, like you know, heart disease and things like that, how predictive they have been about survival in general. But this is one thing I want to look at in general. Like, you know, so one other thing I'm working now that we have this tool, to have a more general model that can look at across multiple diseases. Because, you know, for example, when you are thinking about modifiable risk factors like BMI or smoking or alcohol, we know that that has an effect on across multiple diseases. So, this kind of calculation to really see where the benefit is in the public health, you cannot just look at breast cancer when you're looking at BMI, because BMI has much bigger effect on heart disease. So heart disease needs to come into play. So we are trying to develop models that can look at across diseases and ultimately the mortality. Like, you know, suppose, you know, one of the ultimate endpoint is that can we use this kind of calculations that take information from all SNPs that have been associated with life-threatening diseases, right, and then see that whether we can stratify population for, you know, based on their risk of mortality, like, you know, overall mortality, and, and then see what is the impact of these kind of lifestyle factors based on this. So that's something I would like to work on in the future. Stephen Brand. Um, how much of a problem is it that the data of odds ratios and risks came from um, tertiary care recruitment studies and are going to be applied to the general population, and it has not come from population-based studies, and there's probably also a much greater family history, more severity, et cetera. That's a great question. So uh, I think the, the estimate of the, the odds issues for the epidemiologic factors, they actually all came from the nested case control studies within the cohort. So I think those are fine. And then the, but the, for the SNPs, like some of the SNPs that were not genotyped, we actually took odds issue estimate from case control studies. And what has been generally reported, and I think that is true, that for genetic factors, which is not so influenced by various selection kind of things that we are worried about epidemiologic studies, the odds issues from case control studies, they do not tend to be that much different from the, the more pristine cohort studies or nested case control studies. And we could do that even for the 24 SNPs that were genotyped in our study. We look at those odds issues from the prospective cohort studies versus the case control studies you do not see those kind of differences. And that is, again, probably due to the fact that, you know, that the selections affect that, you know, that usually tend to distort the estimate of the epidemiologic factors. They are much less active when you're considering the, the genetics. So, so I, I think it's a little bit of a concern, and that's why we definitely, when you, when you validate this model in independent prospective cohort studies, it's going to simultaneously check all the assumptions in many ways. But, but at a theoretical level, I don't think it is a big, big uh, concern. Well, I'll just say that, you know, I think your work is a great combination of sort of statistical genetics and, you know, genomics and, and public health impact. And it's really, a, it's really a wonderful melding of those two things. And, and, I, uh, and giving us tools to understand risk better, it's going to change, I think, many things related to public health screening, as you said, and therapy. So, so I want to thank you and, uh, uh, for a great talk and invite everybody to the Wall of Wonder. We'll have some wine and cheese and thank be you. able to talk some more. Thank, Thank you very much.